So the next question from the, uh, uh, for the panel is, um, we are all in an English-speaking country at a conference at a time of great <coughs> intersection of languages and culture. Can you say something about the ability of English to expand um, on the kind of ideas all of you expressed here? English teacher is a stubborn <laughs> <laughs> We're in an English-speaking country at a conference at a time of great intersection of languages and culture. Can you say something about the ability of English to expand and take on the kinds of ideas all of you expressed here? Um, Michael. I've, I'm struck by um, uh, Ibn Arabi's uh, uh, philosophy of translation. Uh, the Tarjuman al Shwak, which means translation of desires or, or longings, um, is also reflects uh, the notion that meaning is in the translation, that meaning is not a static in one place. And he talks about how everywhere the beloved sets, um, uh, uh, sets foot, um, blossoms up as a garden, and as soon as she leaves, it becomes a desert again. So in terms of meaning, every time uh, the meaning is in constant motion, and one of the motions that we saw that we've been discussing is the fact that at this period, um, as, as was just mentioned, the, uh, the meanings, um, the uh, vernacular languages, non-Arabic languages, were embracing and finding ways not of simply translating in the sense of taking from one language to another something which is there, but uh, creating that com living conversation in which the, um, the, uh, the second language somehow becomes uh, another site for the gardening of uh, uh, where the beloved steps. And um, Yaroslav Stekevich, uh, one of the great uh, scholars and translators of Arabic poetry, once said that, um, and I think this is in the question, which is uh, so thoughtful, that in order to translate, one has to, uh, in some sense, um, that the, what is translated has to enrich the, transla uh, the language into which it's translated. There's no existing English that can receive these meanings. And it's part of that creativity for English to grow and shape um, as it does. And I think that's um, that. Uh, one more thing about translation. Um, it shouldn't only be for, for people that teach um, foreign languages to care about translation. I often think that translation is something we do all the time. Uh, every time we have a discussion with a friend and we think we're talking the same language, and we say, oh, you meant that? Yeah. And it took hours of conversation to finally figure out what was meant. And sometimes a lot of uh, uh, difficult feelings can get brought up. So, Life, it, life itself, I think, in Ibn Arabi's thought, is a constant process of translation and a constant uh, and a joy um, to be engaged in that. Stephen? Um, I just want to add a few reflections because uh, unlike all the other panelists here, I've spent rather a long period of time uh, working with foreign students learning English. And I often wondered why, why I got into it in the first place, because it was, as it were, accidental. Uh, when I first started in the 70s, English could not have been described at that point, really, as a world language. Uh, now, absolutely no doubt, 
It is a world language and rapidly changing. And I want to add one thing to what Michael said. I mean, it's, it's perfectly obvious to all of us that there have been various forms of English perfectly adequate. The kind of language spoken in America and is already multiple from West Coast to East Coast. It is added another dimension by all the Englishes which exist in Britain. I think we have to be very careful to realize that even on this kind of horizontal level, there are as many languages as there are peoples and individuals. So it, this is a highly complex process where there is an evolution of expression which is taking place constantly. And the language itself is just a vehicle which is being transformed in the process of expressing meaning. And there is no doubt in my mind, having come into the sort of publishing of Ibn Arabi, that uh, when a book appears in English, which has been locked up, as it were, in the Arabic language, it is an actual event. Uh, it's a bit like a, a bomb going off. If you're, if you're near it, you feel it, you hear it. Uh, maybe other people will hear about it. But the event itself is absolutely real and is transformative because there is something about this meaning which is desperately trying to convey itself to all of us because it's our very substance. It's, we can't avoid it. I, I mean, I agree completely that we, 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 how can we possibly avoid mystical experience? It's the very substance of living as a human being. It's not usually talked about like that because people think of wonderful mystical states and so on and so on. But the reality is that we're constantly being involved in being educated in the reality that we actually are. Every human being is going through this process, knowingly or unknowingly. So to come across these two giants who are wonderful turjamans, wonderful interpreters, and as Pablo mentioned this morning, Ibn Arabi says a, a turjaman, an interpreter, is somebody who unites several languages. So that's a wonderful image to have because that means that, that uh, these, these people that we speak about are really uh, bringers of meaning in a way that is completely without uh, limit. And everybody who reads what they write is participating in this expression of meaning. Um, um, I think there's little to add to all of that, um, but I just would like to say that I, I think many of us, um, just growing up as a dictionary generation, uh, very often think of translation in terms of equivalency. Like we could find, are we going to be able to find something in the target language into which we are translating that is an equivalent or identical to the original. So very often there is this fear that the translation is going to be a pale copy of the original um, or uh, this ho whole notion of original, uh, which is different from whatever else is generated. I think Michael put it very nicely that in, in this interaction with the text, meaning regenerates itself and also in the interaction of reader with the text that happens again and again. Um, so I, uh, when uh, in classroom we talk about translation and usually one of the great fears that the students have is what is going to be lost in translation. My response is that translation is a lost and found place. So it's not just <laughs> losing, you in fact find a lot there as a result of interacting with this text and what you produce um, as a result of it, which is pure uh, 
uh, creativity. It's not copying something. Um, but I would like to add a point which is, I think, irrelevant here, which is if the voices of the people we need to be heard are not known and have not found a space for themselves in, the new, in this target culture, having good translations are going to be, go to waste. Because if you didn't know, for example, that Farouk Farouk lived in Iran in the 20th century and wrote some of the most daring, imaginative expressions of, of her life, you're not going to look for the translation that, you know, Amin Banani and Joshua Kessler did, which is fabulous. So in some ways, it seems to me that for those of us who have access, whether academic or non-academic, one way would be to graft those voices on our own and somehow bring it into the culture so that these names and these works find uh, recognition. And as soon as they are given a little room, they you know, grow their own roots and they grow and they have their own life. And then the, the good translations obviously become very, very important to use. <laughs> I, I just want to spin off on that a little bit further, again, with the theme of verticality, and note that one of the ways when you read Ibn Arabi Rumi, you actually will know you understand it, is if you can see the haq, the reality that he's talking about, in all the other equivalent forms around you. So I can still remember the point at which, having fallen in love with Rumi, I suddenly realized that Emily Dickinson was writing Rumi's quatrains and that Walt Whitman was writing his own Masnavi, <laughs> and that Rilke was writing his own Divana Shams. And for, so that they ceased to be different languages and began to seem the same with this wonderful chronic term, Montic, this, this communication, which is, for Ibn Arabi, each of us is a Tarjaman because we're taking the divine signs and we're returning them to their source. We can't help it, that's what we do. So it's very important not to get bogged down to just language of English or French or German or Arabic, but to realize that uh, in our own day, and, and I can still remember the time when I thought, you never mentioned these things in the old days in academia. I don't think any, some of you may remember Ro Holbrook, uh, who was at some of our conferences and so forth. And I remember when she came to Paris and we were having some, she was living nearby us, we were having a kid at time. And, and I'd seen this amazing, it wasn't a good movie, but the theme song of it was, a, was really amazing. And I said to her, you know, this is amazing. This song and this silly movie really makes me feel like the same equivalent of reading Rumi. And she said, well, of course, if Rumi were around today, he'd be doing rock music. You know, <laughs> at the time. And uh, no, no words can be true. You know, I might be, we might call it a different name now. This was 30 odd years ago. But it was the first other academic I'd met who actually admitted such things. And it was a liberating moment for me. Um, and so all artists are the creators. They're making, they're creating this connection. Some are more effective at it, some are others. And you know, you and this is people don't realize that it's after this time that people basically created the tariqa system. It's when the customs of Ziara, the, the social institutions that we associate with traditional Islam, as as uh, Moon keeps reminding us from this time, most of those were created very creatively in this period, this post-Mongol period that they really spread all over the Muslim world. So we're institution creators. We're you know, if, if you decide that this particular film will communicate something better to people of other languages, that's what these great people were doing. And it can, it just takes all sorts of forms. If I can be for you, just one other thing, because we're going to have dance and music tonight. But I, I wish you could have been there when, the, Pierre Lorty is another French scholar that a lot of us know and so forth. And I remember about 12 years ago that I was in the pressing divorce and everything, and he was, his wife taught dance therapy. And so he and I were Shanghai to go out to this uh, monastery in the country where they had a drummer and you know, all of these very gymnastic, aerobic people who were going to learn the dance therapy and everything. And here are these two uptight, super uptight scholars, you know, in the midst of all these, you know, very, you know, we're 
10, 15 years older than all of the people in the class. But boy, did I learn something about overcoming the nafs that I'll never forget by having to be there. I mean, not by having to be there, because you can't be depressed when you're dancing to this really good music, you know? And so, I, and I mentioned that just because something like, it was a Rumi, you know, it's Sultan Valet and others who created all the instruments of the Medlevia and their music and their dance and their whirling and so forth. But if you do it, it communicates something to you that words might never get to you. So whether it be dance or film or music or just uh, new forms of uh, sohbat, sohbet, sohbat and so forth, what we're being asked to do always, as people did back then, is to create new ways to make that connection between the hakika and its form and, and its expression and to communicate them. And uh, that's why when I come to these things, I always want to see, where are the young people here? Because if you don't have the young people, this will die out just like other things have died out. It's, right it's, here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I've spotted you guys. <laughs>